you'll hand me that. And now, from the bowels of the Bisco Bunker, in the great neighborhood of Woodside, Queens, the geographic center of New York City, brought to you by the Bayport and Blue Point Public Library, ladies and gentlemen, the Block Island Seafood Company's founder and president and galactic leader, Craig Garrity. <laughs> oh, 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 that's great, honey, you've already been working. You've already got the camera, you've already got the thing working. You've already got it working. You can bring the camera a little closer, maybe. Yeah, that was a very nice round of applause you gave me tonight. I really appreciate that. Keep an eye on the battery in case it runs out. It's okay. Are you nervous? A little bit. Why are you nervous? How much battery's on here? 90% maybe? Okay. You think we'll be okay? I hope so. Mm-hmm. What a day. I've been on the run all day. My wife, she's been in school all day. So I had to make my own breakfast. I had to wash my own hair because Maureen wasn't around. Uh, so I gave myself a medal. You know, I think in these trying times, when one day turns to the other and the other turns to the next one, the next one's like the one, you know, 16 days ago, and you don't know what the heck's going on, you need to give yourself a medal. So I don't do this a lot, you know? I don't. I did it uh, for Maureen and I's second anniversary. I gave myself a medal because I didn't think I'd make it that long. <laughs> And today I gave myself a medal because I did my own hair and uh, I'm just not up to it these past couple of days. I'm not really feeling my best. I don't know if, I just don't know if I look as sexy as normal, honey. <laughs> but we're going to power through tonight because we've got our good friends from the Bayport Blue, Bay Blue Point, the Bayport Blue Point Library. All the way out there in uh, Bayport, Long Island. Tonight we're uh, tonight we're drinking Heineken Zero Point Zero. No alcohol in there. You can drink a dozen of these. It's totally fine. And they get in the car and go driving around. I don't know if that's been proven or not. So don't go doing it and saying, "Well, you know, the guy with the fluffy hair on Facebook told me it was okay." I can't be responsible. I just uh, I'm just letting you know. You know, I'm not a cop. But uh, give it a shot. See what happens. You know? Joanne Fiore says her voice is not like you do it. Maureen's voice like this, Joanne. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes tone is in the ear of the man. Okay? And that's the way that Maureen sounds to me. It's, it's sweet when she th says things to me like, Greg, you want to dance? You want to go out tonight? Want to dance? I want to go dancing tonight, Greg. Um, Roz Hyde says, "Howdy from Big D." Howdy from Big D. All right, I guess that's Dallas. Mm -hmm. Oh, a lot of people want to meet me. A lot of people want to meet Maureen. You people can't meet Maureen. It's better she stays on that side of the camera. You've got to see her. She's this quarantine has not done well for her. <laughs> Oh, the sweatpants and, uh, you know, the old t-shirts with the holes in them. I didn't even know we had moths here. That's tasty, honey. Yeah, you can say it. Yeah, I think all you folks should get to meet Maureen. She's lovely. And, uh, boy, did I get lucky. I got so lucky when I met Maureen, and then even luckier when I got to marry her. Oh, uh, Barney McCowan. Oh, on. Barney McCowan. McEwen, love you, Craigie. Oh, hello, Barney. Barney is a very talented, very handsome uh, hunk of a English Englishman coming to us, uh, checking in all the way from Manchester. Well done, Barney. Barney's been out there. He's been uh, raising money on YouTube for uh, for COVID relief. Uh, boy, Barney, send us in the link for YouTube again. I can mention it tonight because. 
people should be people should hear Barney sing, but they should also See get him. yeah get a look at him. He's <laughs> he's a hunk. He's a hunky kid. You know, he's got the great beard. He's got incredible hair. Uh, wow, a heartthrob and a British voice and a British accent too. And he's just lovely. And a lot of people might not know this, but Barney once starred in a short film of mine called Husky. Husky. It's available on YouTube. He says, get yourself back to Manchester for some horse. Ah, uh, you know, it's okay to tell this story because it's, it's culinary. It's cooking related. So Barney's dad, uh, John, uh, Barney and John are, uh, and, uh, and lovely Kath are friends of our family. We have vacationed together, and they've been coming back and forth from Manchester to New York over the years. So I found myself over in England in uh, 2014. I was running a half marathon, saw my cousin Donald for a bit, and then I said, oh, I'm going to stop in to Manchester. Barney, who was a bit of a younger man at the time, he said, I want to take you out, you know, I don't want to do his accent because he might think I'm making fun, but he's got a great, you know, he's got that great British accent. So Barney uh, was probably 17, he was 18 in a couple, he was this close to being 18, which is legal drinking age over there. So Barney took me to a couple of his spots where he knew it wouldn't be any problem. And I kept noticing that he wanted to get all the drinks. I said, Barney, keep your money. I'm assuming your dad gave you some pounds and said, take Craig out. And he was kind of like, I said, well, why don't you just keep the money and tell him that, and tell him that you spent it all on me. It's a win-win. So anyway, we have a great, uh, great day or so. And that night, we're out in, in John's backyard, which abuts a uh, a soccer pitch of a school. Really neat backyard. He's got it decked out like you're in the Caribbean, and it's kind of smelly. There's something that stinks. <laughs> so so I'm like, what is that? And I thought maybe John. I don't know. I was like, is he? Something's wrong with him. I have to tell him. He's got this beautiful girlfriend, Kath, at the time, and I'm like. You know, just, I, I don't want to get embarrassed. He smells. He really stinks. <laughs> so then I spy what he's cooking. It's the weirdest cut of beef I've ever Ugh. seen in my life. And I'm like, that is rancid, John. I, fa I was happy it wasn't him. He says, oh, no, it'll be fine, mate. It'll be fine, Holes. Sure enough, nobody eats it because it stinks and it's terrible. And John tells everybody, don't eat this. Don't eat this. I don't know what the hell's going on. So I said, that is not cow. Is that's what's going on? I don't know if it's dog or 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 what. Sure enough, I get back to the states and John rings me up and he says, "You were right. <laughs> that son of a bitch farmer. He sold me a horse. It was horse meat." Barney's oh. Barney's crying. Uh, Guess who's back? Who's back? Little Lawrence. Little Lawrence. Ten-year-old Lawrence. Welcome back. Welcome back. He says, I think you're the best cook in the world. Oh, Lawrence. And this is Lawrence. Oh, that's great, Lawrence. I don't want you to think I'm drinking beer here, Lawrence. This is no alcohol. It's a Heineken 0, 0.0. You know, for the young kids out there, I have to... Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of kids who look up to me. Yeah. Not a lot of adults who look up to me. At a certain point in time, they're all much taller than I am. Oh, but it's great to be here uh, with the, with my great friends from the Blue Point uh from the Bayport Blue Point Library. Uh, it's a mouthful, I yeah. know. They're good folks over there. Um, so thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Wendy. I know that, uh, and Emma. Uh, all you folks, terrific job. Much appreciated. <laughs> we have two lovely dishes tonight. I'm gonna show you how to make my uh, crab cakes, which are very famous throughout this apartment. And uh, <laughs> we're gonna have a flounder piccata which is very similar to my chicken piccata, but we're gonna use flounder instead. John, if you're you know, short on flounder uh, or chicken, by all means, a nice thin filet of horse will do. Uh, so welcome everybody, let's get started. I think the first thing we should do is, uh, why don't we make guacamole? Sure. Let's make some guacamole. Uh, we had uh, Cinco de Mayo recently. Now. I thought because it was a leap year, it was going to be Siesta de Mayo, that they were going to do on the 6th, mm. because this year Thanksgiving's on a Friday, because of leap year. Oh, is it? Yeah. That's weird. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> it's not. This is why you can't meet her, folks. This is why, because I don't know what she's going to say. 
Oh my god! I it's can't been a long day. You fell for that. It's oh, I can't day. believe you fell for that. That's great. It's going to be a long day. And these are the genuine moments, folks, that you get here on Facebook Live, cooking with the Block Island Seafood Company. Little logo, big logo. Let's get started. Your brother Matt says Jose Black and Blue is watching. Ah, oh, Jose Black and Blue. Black and Blue. Uh, Jose was uh, as a chef. He was a friend of my brother Matt's. Uh, they are friends. And we had this huge party out in uh, the Hamptons one year. Summer in 96. And it was a, I mean, it was a blowout party. It was massive. Um, and I'm not like a big party guy. I like small, intimate gatherings. Anyway, uh, we had a huge oil drum that we converted into a barbecue grill that day. So me and my buddy Niall and Will and Rich and Jim were all taking turns grilling up meat. Will's mom uh, brought out these steaks that were like this big. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, Jose uh, was a guest there. And uh, as I said, friend of my brother Matt's, it's late at night. We're out of charcoal. We have no fire. We have no flame. And he was hungry. i assuming maybe folks were imbibing and various things that made them hungry late at night. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Certainly not me. Anyway... Jose uh, dug his hand into a beer cooler with a broken bottle, cut his hand. So he's running around with a, his hand bandaged. This lady, Carol, Carol from Lobster Inn, bandaged up his hand. He's walking around like this, and he wants to cook steak. And he's got this great Latin accent. So he's saying, Put de grillo! Put de grillo! And we kept saying, we have no more charcoal. We have none. We have no flame. This is all we have. I mean, you can barely light a cigarette off this thing. And he kept saying, well, they're freaky. We do it black and blue. <laughs> One, two. What a night. We had a fox show up that night. Uh, Gabrielle Ragona says she's heard a lot about you through Blue Point Bayport Library. So happy to finally see the cooking in action. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's great that you'd be here tonight. Is it Gabrielle or Gabriella? Gabrielle. Gabrielle. Nice to meet you, Gabrielle. Pleasure. A pleasure. So I picked up some avocados the other day. Not bad. There's a little bit of black in here, uh, but not bad. Don't worry about the fact that, you know, there's a touch of discoloration in the avocado. It's not a big deal. You're going to smash it around and make guacamole out of it anyway. So here we have our pit with the butt of your knife here. Just sort of Pop that pit right out. It's hard to get off. It is a little hard. So, you know, just knock it off. But that's all you need. So when you're making guacamole, all we really have to do here is, if we want to, is just get a large spoon. You know, we can just get a large spoon and just scoop right out. No problem. But I know a lot of you folks... You come to expect more than that from me. So sometimes you want to have like uh, some avocado slices. So what I'm doing here is I'm just running the knife into the avocado. But I'm feeling the knife hit the skin. This is not a turtle shell. The knife will go through the skin, folks. So be careful, okay? So I feel the knife. And then I just slide the knife down. Then again, I would just run my, run the spoon here like this. And now I have these sort of uh, nice avocado slices. I'll do that again for you. Last thing you do, you just sort of slice the avocado and then scoop it right out. And you'll get these slices. See, anytime you buy something, Nice slice, just like that. You see how we're working? This is beautiful. Anytime you buy something, uh, like at a you know diner, and they call it California style, a California burger, it's got avocado on it. Sliced avocado. Sliced avocado. I'd say they should put marijuana on it. That would be really California style. Or Colorado. So I've got some some smashed up uh, little bits here. I'm going to put in a, this is a very simple guacamole. We don't need to go crazy. I got two garlic cloves here. Smash a roux. Two smash. Maureen's got that smash. You see if you do the smash. 
And that's that. You don't have to worry about cilantro, because sometimes with uh, guacamole, you like to put in cilantro. Maybe you like to put in a little bit of uh, tomato. You don't have to do that for this. This is going to be nice and easy. We could put in some, some shallot, too. Since I have a shallot here, we'll put in a shallot. All right. I gotta start moving some of my stuff here faster. It's starting to go bad on me. But you know what? I don't mind if the food goes bad here because it's only Maureen gonna eat it. You know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody out there? Is everybody okay? I don't know. Is everybody We're okay out there in, in Bayport? Waiting Blue for point. some comments. Kelly Sheridan wants to know how how's Larry. Oh, uh, Larry's doing well, everybody. Larry is, uh, he's hiding out somewhere, probably in Long Beach, probably, you know, sorting through garbage cans or whatever he likes to do. It's a really nice library there at the uh, Bay Point, Bayport Blue Point Library. I think they're building a new one, right? They're building a new library that I think used to be an old convent. Hmm. I hope it's not haunted. So I got some salt, some pepper, I got shallot. I have, um, oh, we're going to need some lime. Mm -hmm. And I have, roll that lime out. So I keep these limes out at room temperature. If you keep your limes in the refrigerator, you'll get a little bit less juice. You know, so you want to soften up. There's little pockets in here. So that's why when you see on TV, they always do this. It's not because it looks cool. There is a function to that. So it's time for me to sharpen my knife. So I'm going to get some lime juice in here. Yeah, let's sharpen this knife right now, honey. I'll do this over the sink. You're really getting so good on those camera turns. People ask quite a bit, how often do I sharpen my knives? When do I sharpen them? I... Sharpen them, you know, like you would when you're getting gas. How often do you fill up your car with gas? If you don't drive it, you don't put gas in it. If you don't use your knife, you don't need to sharpen it. Plain and simple. Now I'm really nervous because Jose's watching. You know? Matt's probably told him all sorts of bad things about us. No. No. So I'm just going to take the back of my spoon. This is an avocado spoon. Very specific. You, if you don't have one of these, you can't make avocado. You can make this as thin or as chunky as you like, but we're going to put this on top of our crab cake. Yeah, you could do tartar sauce, and if you're somebody who prefers tartar sauce, send me an email. I'll send you my tartar sauce recipe. It's delicious. I believe it is some sort of a version of Matt's, which he sort of converted from Anthony Bourdain's. So it's not as good as Anthony Bourdain's and it's not as good as Matt's. But it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. All right, nice and easy, that's it. That, that's basically gonna be my guacamole. Very important though, we gotta taste this. Nice and creamy. Would you like to have some guacamole later on tonight? Yeah, sure. Barney says we need another Block Island Live Lounge session. Yeah, we need a Block Island Live Lounge, Live Lounge, Live Live Lounge session. Oh, that would be good, Barney. How good would it be to all just get to hang out together right now? Oh, I know everyone is, you know, getting really claustrophobic and things like that, but I'm telling you folks, it's just a lot worse for me here. It's just a lot worse for me. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn Pastine, salt in the guacamole? You bet, Lynn. <laughs> I put salt in there and I tasted it. It tastes delicious. Well, wouldn't you say it's there's no amount of measuring, it's just. It's, it's what taste. you like. Yeah, oh yeah. If you're looking for a specific measurement, uh, I won't give you one. I'll leave it up to you. I trust you. The beauty of cooking is making some mistakes. You know, it's like, um, 
it's like anything else. You're, you're not going to be great at it the first time you do it, but you'll just keep getting better at it the more you do it. And the more confident you get, the more chances you'll take and, and things like that. So don't be afraid to, uh, you know, go off the recipe. So here I've just got a bag, right? The important thing with this bag is I roll out any air in the bag. What keeps the, gu the guacamole nice and green? It's keeping the air off of it. See, when the, the, when the air gets on the guacamole, you get this oxidation, right? And that's what turns it brown. But you get some lime juice on there. And the vitamin C, the uh, acidic acid, is what keeps it nice and green. So I take the air out of this bag. I flatten this out. Mm. And there's no air. The lime's going to keep it nice. Now, if you're having a party, some people say, oh, uh, an old wives trick is to put the, guaco the avocado pit in the mm. guaco. It's, it's sort of really more of a, I don't think there's any scientific. I'll have to ask Rich DeLore on that. But I don't believe there's any scientific background to that. Um, so, I'm just going to throw this in the refrigerator. Thank you, honey. And I think there's a, uh, uh, a, a some crab meat. Would you mind grabbing that? It's sealed up in a little deli container. How's Jose doing? Jose, are you okay? Are you still with us? I hope so. And my friend Larry... Where is Larry watching from? Larry or oh, Lawrence? I'm sorry, Lawrence. Lawrence. Where are you watching from, Lawrence? I'll give him a second to answer. Yeah, no, take your time. I'm not going to make it a multiple choice for you. So I'm going to uh, make some crab cakes for you real quick, and then I'll show you how to, how to cook them up. I got a green pepper here, okay? I got this at the store today. Uh, luckily, they were having a sale because it was 50% off. <laughs> Stop it, honey. Thank you. Uh, so, when people are cutting green peppers, I always wash. Wash the green peppers. There's little crevices where bacteria can get in there, things like that. You got people handling these things. Even though we're going to cook them, it's important to wash, especially right now with people touching them. And, you know, you want to be careful. Uh, Cold water? Uh, well, yeah. You could just take room temperature water, as I always say. There's a ratio, about a gallon of water to just a little cap of Clorox bleach or any bleach trailer. And that chlorinates the water. Run your food right through there. It sanitizes everything. I meant, I, feel, I forgot to mention about the guacamole. You know, when you make it, don't put it all out at once when you're having a party. Put a little bit out at a time. So that if you do see it starts to get a little brown and your neighbor from down the street, Nancy, is over. And she's very... Karen. Judge, Karen. She's very judgmental. Like, Oh, you see that brown guacamole? See the brown guacamole? You come out there, you put some nice fresh green guacamole on there. So not all crab cakes have a uh, green pepper. The Block Island Seafood Company crab cakes do. Dennis yeah. Bracken says hi. Welcome, Denny. Welcome back. The Block Island Seafood Company crab cake is probably our most requested uh, appetizer on our catering menu. Back in the old days, like I'm talking back in like uh, 2019 when we used to cater parties, uh, <laughs> this would be our number one ask for appetizer. Number two? Lobster rolls. Lobster rolls always way up there, but every party, everybody always orders pigs in a blanket. Mm. Guaranteed. Oh, Rich said, sorry I'm late, but I heard my name. What do you need? Well, Rich, I'm of the, th of the school of thought that says, you, people say you can leave a avocado pit in the, your guacamole and that'll keep it from turning brown. I say no. It's the lime, the acidic acid, that keeps the color. And I need you to back me up on that. If I'm wrong, it's okay. It wouldn't be the first time. I'm going to throw an egg in here. One egg. I'm, ha I'm half in your recipe. Uh, I've made... I made some ahead of time. Tony and Camera Case wants to know, can we get the recipe for your crab cakes printed out? Yeah, I'll print them out and then just, you know, send me your address and I will, I guess I'll just drive them out to you. Do you want me to print them out for you, Tony? Is that what you want? I'll print them out. You know what? Let's, get this, let's give this one to Tony. Where should we take it? 
Get the address. Tony, I'll bring it right now. Honey, uh, you're in charge. I gotta run. Okay. Yes, Tony. Are you coming? Are you are you watching us from the library? Because I think that um, they well we they were supposed to post them on the web page, I believe. But if not, I will get them for you. I'll post these crab cake recipes on www.blockislandseafood.com. And if you want to email me, you can email me, Craig at blockislandseafood.com. I'm going to have to talk to Kelly to make sure that these things were posted. I don't want to speak out of school. A little bit of Hellman's mayonnaise is going to go in here as well. Maureen knows when you bring out the Hellman's, you bring out the best. Some Old Bay. Old Bay is a uh, aromatic spice, a little bit of paprika in there, some thyme. Goes great on French fries, goes great on uh, a shrimp boil or a crab boil. And uh, we should have probably reached out to these folks to get a little plug, you know, get some, you know, get a little bonus money or something from them. Let's keep that in mind, okay? okay. Who's in charge of this operation? I can't do it all. Sure you can. Oh, clearly I can. <laughs> a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. That's fine right there. Uh, I put in a dash of... Did I put in some mustard? I can't even remember. A little Rich, dash of Dijon. Rich says, I say both pit and lime, anything that stops the guac air reaction. Okay. Well, Rich is uh, not really taking a stand there. So, well done, Rich. Uh, I have a, now your recipe calls for a half a cup of breadcrumbs, but I'm half in your recipe, so I've got a quarter cup of breadcrumbs. Just regular seasoned, like, four seed breadcrumbs. Those go in there. Now, we need, very, very important, we need a little bit of lemon zest. I'm really pushing this zester. You know, Megan Phillips, who's been watching a lot of these events, uh, Megan was the winner of the knife sharpener, which we have not mailed out yet, because I, you know, I'm... Sorry, I'm just not running to the post office right now. And, uh... Mom, it's whoa. seven already? Wow, that was a fast half hour. Yeah. Woo! Yeah, 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 yeah! Yeah! Yeah, yeah! Thank you to all the essential workers out there. So, uh... I told Meg's husband, Jim, that he had to get her a zester. So... Pre-quarantine, Meg was really not on her game when it comes to cooking. Although, I, I don't know that for sure. But it seems like she's made really great strides during quarantine. And I said, Jim, you got to get her a zester. And she said she's not quite ready for that, that she was using the bottled lemon juice. I think you're ready for this. This is a great tool. You can shave lemon zest, great for cheese. I do Maureen's nails with this thing. It's just incredible. <laughs> So we're gonna get a little bit of a lemon, lemon juice in here as well. You see the power there, honey? Mm. Mm. <laughs> what do you think of that? Huh? Pretty, pretty powerful stuff. I have here some, some crab meat. Now I've gone through this crab meat. I've checked it out because sometimes you'll get some shells in it. Tonight I'm going to be using, tonight I'm using claw meat. Sometimes I use lump, sometimes I use claw. You know, it depends on the client. If the client's really, you know, I can really gouge them, then I just tell them it's lump, but I put in claw. Just kidding, we would never do that here at the Block Island Seafood Company. But tonight I'm using claw meat. And I, I describe claw meat uh, to almost like a chicken thigh. So claw meat has more flavor than lump. Lump looks beautiful, they're big, uh, but they don't carry as much flavor as the claw meat. If I'm making a huge batch, or it's available at the store in 8-ounce containers, this was a 16-ounce container tonight, I will buy 8 ounces lump, 8 ounces claw, combine them. Because to the eye, the customer says, whoa, you see those big, beautiful lumps in there? Uh, but it tastes so great, so that's why I mix them. Much like chicken thighs, chicken breast. Chicken breast, people like it, it is... It's just white meat, it's easy to eat, fine. But it does not have the flavor that a chicken thigh does. But we still got some nice big lumps in here. That's a nice big lump. Mm -hmm. So I've felt through this uh, already, just in case, because sometimes you'll get, um, you'll get some uh, shell. 
Now, I should have mixed up my mix before I put my crab in, but I got busy talking. It's not going to be okay. I worked at a place called the uh, Water's Edge down in Long Island City, real fancy joint. Uh, every day was a living hell there. I, I, oh, my God. That was a horrible experience. Anyway, I saw the chef there. Some guy was uh, cooking. It was his first day. He, they were putting out crab cases in a mousse bouche, a little you know compliment from the chef. And this guy put all this crab meat. They were using jumbo lump. It was a waste of money, but I didn't say anything. And he just put it all in one big vat, started mixing it and smashing it. And the chef, whoa, the chef went ballistic on this guy. It was such a nasty environment to work in. We're not like that here at the Black Island Seafood Company. We're very nice. So something to keep in mind, when you get the crab meat, you, you know, you, I've already gone through it. I've picked it around. But sometimes there'll be some shells in there. So you, you know, you want to make sure you don't leave any. Ow! That's what it would be like if there was a shell in there, but there wasn't. So don't be nervous. Uh, Tara Byron Riley Williams says Lawrence is watching from Oak Island, North Carolina, doing online school. There's, wow. There is a virus. There is a virus. So he's doing online schooling. Does Lawrence live in North Carolina? Or did he decide he was going to go to North Carolina because that's where he thought it would be good to take online classes? Uh, we'll have to wait. Well, we're going to have to wait and see. I hope school's going okay for you, Lawrence. Today, New York City announced that they'll be doing summer school via Zoom as well for almost 100,000 kids. Oh, summer school is the worst. I don't know why I did it every year. Okay, so I have here what I like to call my, my crab cake mix. And you see I used this, this spatula to sort, of, to sort of fold it around as opposed to complete smash and devastation of it. We don't want smash and devastation. But we can see all this right now, honey? Yeah. All right, so what I'm going to do here, just, just real quick, is normally at this point, I take this, I put it in the refrigerator for about 15, 20 minutes. You see, dried breadcrumbs are, are just that. They're dried breadcrumbs. Kathleen Johnson keeps reminding you it's shout-out time. How about shout-out? Don't let us down. We already did the shout-out. Um, shout-out has passed. Maybe she stepped away. Yeah. Yeah, we did the shout-out, Kathleen. We would not miss our shout-out time. So, normally this would go in the refrigerator for about 15, 20 minutes. Because as I was saying, dried breadcrumbs are just that. They're dry. But with all those ingredients that we had in there... They suck them all in. They take in all that flavor. They expand. And this is a little bit on the wet side right now. In about 15, 20 minutes, it would be uh, a lot more tacky, which is exactly what we want, something a little more tacky. But just for the sake of showing you how I do it, I make about a meatball size. And then I just drop it right into a bowl of panko breadcrumbs, and then I finish them right in my hand, just like that. I pat them down, and I just pat them, and that's a beautiful it's gorgeous. crab cake. If only we had, like, some already made in the refrigerator. <gasps> We're at commercial now, so you can say whatever you want. Now is when we go to commercial. You're doing great tonight, Maureen. You're really doing great tonight. Thank you. It goes right to the fridge. Oh. So what do we have here? Let's just take a look. We've got a couple of really nice crab cakes ready to go. I'm going to do them in my cast iron pan. A lot of different ways to cook crab cakes. You can, uh, if you have a deep fryer and you want to deep fry them, do it. At many restaurants that I've worked at, that's the way we did it. It's fast, it's easy, it's not a problem. The only problem with it is that I, you know, if your fryer's not clean, if the, uh, you know, if the oil has been sitting around or something like that, it's, it's just not going to taste great. So what I normally like to do is have the oven on and put the crab cake in uh, just a dash of butter and a little bit of olive oil. Just to get some color on the crab cake. That's all I want, really, is to get color on the crab cake. I flip it around a little bit, and then I finish it in the oven. If I'm doing a large party, and 
I have a, a bunch of crab cakes that I have to make. I make a bunch of little crab cakes, same exact recipe, same exact way. I just get, you know, uh, a very tiny person to make them because they have... She's so dumb. She's tired. She's been at school all day. So uh, th in that case, I put them on a sheet tray uh, with some parchment paper, and I cook them at 400 degrees for about 10 minutes. Little ones, just like that. And the parchment paper actually gets them a little brown, and that works fine as well. But for the larger crab cake, which we have tonight, I'm going to just do it in the pan with a little bit of olive oil and butter just to get some color on them. I'll finish them in the oven. Oh, Lawrence lives in North Carolina. But in Cary, North Carolina, he's at the beach visiting his Nana Tara. Oh! Such a nice boy. What a good kid. That's really nice, Lawrence. I'm glad that you're, you're visiting with your Nana. He's got a lucky Nana. My Nana would never let me watch Facebook when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. We didn't have Facebook when I was a kid, Lawrence. I was a kid, it was like 10 years ago. So I have here these crab cakes and they're cold and that's exactly what I want. I want something that's cold so that it's gonna hold up in the pan. If you go from where we just made it and right into the pan, they're gonna fall apart. We don't need that. I got some good heat going here. Maureen's gonna come in for a closer look. That's a beautiful cast iron frying pan we have here. It's probably about 50, uh, probably about 50 years old, this frying pan. And we should get another 50 years out of it. Right? Mm -hmm. I hope so. So as I said, we just want to get a little bit of heat on that. And while that finishes cooking, I want to, uh, you know, just let you know what's going on for our next thing. Because our next dish is going to be a flounder piccata, which I have never made up until about, oh, maybe a half hour ago. I made some flounder piccata, and it came out pretty good. So I was glad to know that I wasn't leading you down the wrong path. You know butter or olive oil in the pan? I have both. I have a little bit of butter, and I have a little bit of olive oil. See, olive oil at a high heat really starts to smoke up really, really fast. Mm -hmm. With the butter in there, we get some fat content in there, and then we increase what is called the smoke point. Ideally, uh, if you want to just do these, you know, fried all the way in the house, no problem. Frying pan like that with some vegetable oil or canola oil. But I know that I just, as I said, I just wanted to get some color on them. That's the important thing. And remember, folks, I've mentioned this before. When you're flipping something in your pan, you're never flipping it towards yourself. You always flip away. All right? Always flip away. Now, why don't we just put this right in the fridge, and I have a plate with some flounder on it. Honey, would you grab that? Thank you. Maureen's being really helpful tonight. She's, for the most part, very, very kind. And I don't, you know, really, folks, behind here, she makes faces, she's nasty. Uh, it's, it's, but I, whatever, I don't know, I just do it. I do it anyway because I'm a nice guy. Just in case it gets smoky, mm -hmm. I don't want you getting upset. Okay, now, I'm just going to show the folks. You can stay right there. Okay. Unless you want to come in and we'll show them how to flip again. Let's figure out how to how to Yeah, so flip. always important. Remember, we flip away from ourselves. Just flip away. There you go. That's fine. Why flip away? Because if we flip towards us, we run the risk of splashing us with oil yeah. and butter and things that will hurt us, and we don't want to get hurt. And I'm just going to finish this right in the oven. What's the oven temperature at? I got the oven at 350. Winter or summer flounder, Brad Reese wants to know. You know, Brad, 
and uh, I have to do my nightly plug for Brad in the Someday Cam Charter. Uh, recently saw some photos of Denny holding up some big flounder, uh, fluke rather. Brad, you have to help me out here. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the winter flounder, help me out Brad, which is the larger of the two, the winter or the summer? See, the fluke and flounder, obviously, uh, I think biologically they're the same. And I think that the, you know, they're both flat fish. And the, the way the eye, the eye sort of goes from one side of the head to the other. Brad's going to have to write something up for us here. Uh, these were large flounder. I'm used to much smaller fillets. I, was, I wanted to get a flounder tonight so that I could fillet it for everybody. I went to my store today and I noticed these really large flounder fillets. And I thought, I don't know if that's flounder. Because I got to be honest with you here. Sometimes, not me, but sometimes a fish store will get a little, uh, shall we say, uh, cheeky? Cheeky with how they label some of the fish. Uh, red snapper, for example, is not always tr red snapper. Sometimes it's something called red mullet. And. Uh, this flounder today, I'm not sure what it was, Brad. It looked pretty, pretty thick and long. I mean, they were they were this long and very thick. So I thought, oh, maybe it was a, a really large sized fluke. Traditionally, flounder that I know are a little smaller, and the fillet is uh, definitely thin. So on a on a flounder, you'll get four fillets because a flounder or a fluke, you have uh, four sections of it. It's it's a flat fish. And you'll get the top and bottom, uh, left and right. So you get four four pieces. Brad, so help me out. Is the which is the larger of the two, the summer or the winter? Lawrence wants you to know he loves guacamole. Lawrence, I love guacamole. And being that I'm Catholic, tonight's guacamole will be holy guacamole. Mm -hmm. Oh. I should have said it because I was a great old. Brad says summer is bigger. Fluke have teeth, predatory species. No fleet, no no teeth on a flounder? Are you sure? Because I got a flounder one time and it had no teeth, and I thought, wow, that must have been a fluke. Oh wow. <laughs> um Brian Putri wants to know, where do you get your fish? We are unable to find an open store. Tonight's seafood came from 30th Avenue and 35th Street, Ocean Seafood. And I normally never question them. They are absolutely mm. fantastic. I just thought this fluke looked really big. And I asked for a whole fish so that I could show you how to play it. And he was like, Craig, these are they so big. Um, Brian LaBarbera, Mr. Craig Garrity from Holy Cross to Black Island. Wow, Brian, how are you? Brian is uh, Brian is from Queens, uh, Jackson Heights, I think. St. Bart's kid, if I'm not mistaken, right, Brian? Uh, I was a St. Sebastian's boy. Uh, St. Bart's parish over in Jackson Heights uh, had a very uh, low ceiling in their gym. So if you took a jump shot sometimes, you would, well, I was terrible, so, you know, my jump shot would hit the ceiling. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in, Brian. Oh, let's see. I think I think our crepe cakes might be done. So why don't I get a little plate for those, honey? Maybe something like this. You love that plate. I love this plate. Barney says, fly me over and I'll be your live laughter, giggling away here. Thank you, Barney. We would love it. Brian LaBarbera says, Elmhurst St. Bart's. Elmhurst St. Bart's. I got the parish. Now my... My assistant is going to grab the guacamole. I'll bring it over here for you. Lauren, Lauren says, good job cooking. You want to be the president of cooking. I want to be the president of cooking. Sure, I'll take it. Uh, my lady friend here is going to grab me the guacamole. And we have, thank you, Maureen. We've got two crab cakes here. I'm not going to mix the, the plate up with a bunch of uh, greens. Maureen despises 
when there's greens on the plate. She doesn't like it. If she orders chicken wings, she says to the to the waiter, and ask him not to put any lettuce on there. Just, she just doesn't like it. Who wants hot wings sitting on a piece of lettuce? I got you. I got you, honey. So here's our bag of guacamole. Lawrence, the holy guacamole. What I did was, I put it in this bag. I'll take off this corner and we'll kind of make it like a like a piping bag, okay? Not that I bake, but now we take our bag like that and we'll just squeeze it right out. Perfect. And Maureen's got a shot on that, right? Mm-hmm. Just like that. That looks perfect to me. Looks good. You like that? Yeah. Why don't I try one? Are you gonna wanna try one later? Maybe. Oh, then I'll make you a fresh spoon. Who put the spoon with the pork star? Oh, this is gonna be a heck of a here. Let's see how we did. Yeah, crunchy on the outside, and I, oh, stop it. Stop it. Oh, that's, that really is good, though. So, with our crab cakes here, you can see in here, it's, it's really just all crab. For one pound of crab meat, it only calls for a half a cup of breadcrumbs. That's not a lot. Mm-mm. And then we finish it with a little bit of panko bread crumb, and that gives it a little crunch. Lots of looks yummies. So oh, yum. it really is. For anybody in the Woodside area, the crab cake at uh, Donovan's is our recipe. We're very happy about that. So, flounder piccata. Uh, Patty Farrelly wants to know, how long did you chill them in the fridge before you cooked them? Big shout out from Galway. Uh, the crab cakes? Patty, what I do is I make the mixture first. And then I put the mixture in the refrigerator for about 15 minutes. And then I take that mixture out. I form them into the crab cakes with a little bit of panko breadcrumb. If I'm ready to go, I'll cook them right at that moment. Otherwise, I'll make them and put them back in the fridge for, you know, a day at least, no problem. When I'm doing a party, I cook everything the night before, leave it in the fridge, not a problem. The main thing is after you've made that initial batch of uh, crab cake mixture, that has to sit in the fridge for about 15, 20 minutes to let those dried breadcrumbs soak everything up. So I'm just gonna throw a little bit of penne into this water here. Just need a couple of noodles, not much. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna use the same pan. Why not? It's one less dish for you, honey. <laughs> she laughs, folks. She laughs. It's... <sighs> I'm off duty after this. She's off duty <laughs> after this. My wife is really terrific. She's beautiful. She's lovely. Uh, she is a one of a kind. Did I say that right? Is that what you wanted me to say? <laughs> Did I forget anything? No. That was it, right? Yes. Okay. And they finished with a smile, you said. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Maureen. All right. I, I got the same pan here. It's got a little bit of burnt butter in it, but I'm okay with it. My oven is on still as well. I got this flounder, as I said. It's a little thick, so uh, maybe maybe it was fluke, Brad. Lawrence wants to know, do you do cooking parties for kids ever? Oh, we've never done a cooking party for a kid's cooking party, Lawrence. But for you, you get up to New York and we'll figure it out. Well, what would he, what, what would you want? What yeah, well, would, would, give me some requests, Lawrence. I don't want to assume that, uh, you know, you like, well, certainly would have to have guacamole there. That's he likes salmon, he said he that yesterday. Salmon. He likes salmon, he likes guacamole. So we'll do that, Lawrence, we'll figure it out. Here I have a little bit of uh, just white flour 
and I add a little bit of black pepper to that white flour. Just a touch of salt to that. Shout out to my mom. Hopefully she's watching. I haven't seen her pop up. This was my mother's uh, wooden spoon. Yeah. I stole it from her when I was 12. She's still looking for it. Oh, uh, you're too kind. Stop it. Oh, I get a little, uh, some olive oil into this black cast iron frying pan. And we want to make sure your pan's good and hot here. Because when the flounder hits the pan, we don't want the flounder like sitting in, uh, we don't want the flounder sitting in oil that's not hot. So let's just take a look here real quick. Let's see if the, the oil is hot. Well, we're getting some reaction from the flounder, but not the reaction I want. I want a little more sizzle, just a little more sizzle. So in the meantime, what I'm gonna do here is just take my, we're, this is called dredging. We've dredged the flounder in, in the seasoned flour. And don't throw your flour away because right at the end, you're going to want to use your flour again. <laughs> Same thing. I sort of shake this off. And let's see if I hear anything. Mm. Now, I want to wait just another 10 seconds. Lauren says he wants salmon, guacamole, and any fish. I'll get there no matter what. Okay, Lauren. You got it, Lawrence. Boy, you're a dedicated young man. So, again, we don't want to, this fish going in there if it's not going to cook right away. And I can How's see that? it's reacting right away. That's exactly what we want. So now, I don't just drop this piece in right away. I kill some time. Five, six, seven, eight, nine seconds even. Because the temperature of the pan came down when that piece went in. We bring the temperature of the pan back up with a little bit of chitta chatter. And there we go. That goes in now. I'm going to make sure everybody's in the pan. And all we really want to do here is just get a, get a crust on the outside. So, flour with a little bit of this olive oil, the flour that shakes off the flounder, hitting that olive oil, we're actually creating a bit of a roux, R-O-U-X. Maria Helena of Concha Almen. Hi, Craig, love your cooking. I'm Maria Helena, Hugo's mom. Oh, legendary. Hugo is one of my uh, all-time, all-time great buddies from Flushing. And uh, Hugo's mom is a noted ceviche expert. Hugo raves about her ceviche. So Maureen, let's take a, 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 a quick look here. Okay, I've got some questions coming through. Okay, great. So as we've said before, we want to we want to talk flip away from us. See, we're just getting a nice little bit of a yellow yellow crust here. We cook the outside. That's all we need. Okay. Give me a question. One second. Okay. Uh, Stephen Bella, can you set up a table on the fire escape for dinners? We're not allowed to, but we're thinking about it. I'm thinking about we're thinking about going there for vacation. Now, now Carrie Fitzgerald is jumping in. Lawrence and family are welcome here to visit Chef Craig. It would certainly be a night to remember. All right, there you That's go. That's nice. Lawrence, you're all set. So I'm just going to take that flounder that's been cooked. Mm -hmm. If you want it more golden brown, keep cooking it more. I'm going to leave it in the oven right now. And I have here some chopped shallots and chopped garlic. And I'm going to add that right to this pan. Traditionally, this uh, is done with chicken, chicken piccata. One of my favorites. I love chicken piccata. The pan is very hot. So I'm just going to keep that temperature low. And I still need some more lemon, which I have right here. My shallots, garlic, cooked up 
got hot really quick. So I add some lemon here. Maybe more you can get a shot of that. You'll see how the lemon sort of deglazes the pan. And while Maureen's got that on there, I'll show you some lemon zest that we have right here. Lemon zest going in. Now I want to bring some heat back up into this uh, pan because I'm going to add a little bit of white wine to it. And when I hit the white wine, I want to I want to sort of burn off the alcohol, so I want to have a higher heat on that pan. Uh, Brad, whoops. Brad says if you did that with flounder, it would have curled up. Fluke is a bit harder of, of a fillet and won't curl. Great stuff. Yeah, I agree, Brad. I think it was fluke. Uh, Warren Lee wants to know, what does piccata mean? Piccata is Italian for taste of the limon. And throughout um, Positano, for example, where my wife and I went on our honeymoon, uh, what a lovely time that was. Mm -hmm. Filled with images of lemons yeah. uh, all around. Do we have any lemon stuff around here, honey? No. Uh, yeah? What did I say piccata meant? Oh, Carrie Fitzgerald is Lauren's great aunt. Yeah, we're trying to figure this all out. This is one crazy family. I'm excited. Uh, they're all they're all terrific. So uh, my wine is cooking here. Lemon juice is cooking. I'm going to add some of these capers. Capers going in. The caper berry. That's known as the caper berry. The caper berry grows uh, like on a on a bush, and then the caper itself has a, a twig that sticks off it. The twig gets pulled, and then these get brined, so they got a bit of a uh, uh, ooh, a bit of a tang in the mm -hmm. back of your jaw there. So that's gonna finish off nicely, and we're gonna add a little bit of butter now. I'm going to start to let the butter melt in there. Now sometimes you'll see chicken piccata and it'll be very uh, yellow. And that's because sometimes some restaurants, they tend to use, uh, they tend to use like what's called chicken base. And there's nothing wrong with it. I use it around here sometimes. And what chicken base is, is like a powdered bouillon. But you know it's got a, uh, a real yellow look to it, almost like a neon. Uh, we won't have any chicken stock in this dish. But sometimes chicken piccata restaurants will have that in there. And it'll give, it'll give off this very yellow appearance. Uh, it's a bit of a short, a bit of a shortcut, because what they're doing in a lot of cases is they might have their chicken pre-cooked, for example, or they might do the chicken in the pan like I did with the flounder, pull it out, but not generating enough flavor, so they use this chicken, uh, chicken base, but it gives it a weird look. Ours is going to have a, almost like a brownish look to it, but what I do now is add just a little bit more butter and. I had told you I had this flour left here, so I'm going to drop a, a nub of butter in that flour, roll it around. Now, this is called a belmagne, belmagne, which is French for bill, which is butter, magne, which is to manipulate, manipulate, the belmagne. It's good. You know, Larry, who speaks French fluently, thought that that was for real. He said, as you know that... So the bill money, make sure the flour has been really worked in there. We don't want any, any raw flour in here. So I put it in a piece of 
the butter with the flour. The reason I'm doing that is just going to sort of tighten up the, uh, just going to tighten it up a bit. 20% on the battery. We're going to make it. Looks like we made it. Not yet, but we're getting there. Megan wants to know what she's missed. She couldn't tune in to tonight. Oh, well, Meg, you missed some great crab cakes. There's a buzz about the crab cakes. My holy guacamole. And now, now I'm finishing off our flounder piccata. Yeah, we got a nice soft work in here. I love this dish. I love, uh, well, I love chicken piccata. And now I love flounder piccata. I like lemon. I like things that make you go like, ooh, that's, ooh, that, ooh, that's good. I like that a lot. Uh, we need some basil. We'll finish off this dish with some basil. Not Tony Basil, who we found out last night sang the song. Oh, Mickey. Oh, Mickey. Oh, Mickey, you're so fine, you blew my mind, hey, Mickey. Oh, we'll keep that one. So, same thing, we'll do a, uh, a chiffonade of the bass, sort of wrap it up here. Run your knife right through. Slow motion. Regular speed. There we go. You see that? And now we've got these beautiful ribbons. Beautiful. Finish that off. I think it's done, hon. Round plate? Sure. I think that the little white plate is not appropriate for this one. Let's see, how about we do this? Just get a little bit of yellow on there. You know, yellow and blue make green. Mm. Now, oh, I had, uh, I had uh, the, what do you call it? I had the pasta. Oh, yeah. Not a problem. And again, the folks can't see in the sink, right? Because that's where the dirty dishes are. I'm going to put some of the pasta right into here. And I'm just going to get the pasta tossed in there. pasta as a bit of a bed for our flounder. Now this dish, as I said, is really, really uh, interchangeable between flounder and chicken. So if you like the dish, but you don't like flounder, just do the same exact concept with chicken. But make sure your chicken's cooked all the way through. Get some nice thin, thin fillets of the chicken, okay? And here's our flounder. In this case, our fluke. Oh, smells delicious. I'm gonna put one right here. And another one right there. Lastly. Gorgeous. This is such a beautiful pan. I love the pan. Did you get a nice shot here, honey? I did. Let's, let's give him one more shot with a little bit of the, the Tony Basin. And that is our flounder, flounder piccata. Piccata, as Giada would say. Lemon, as Giada would say. That looks delicious. Well, do we have any questions out there? Anybody, anybody nervous? Anybody 
uh, have, have anything to say? Carrie's telling Lawrence we'll get to see Chef Craig love, li live sometime soon. Dennis Bracken says Mickey does not like the song. Well, Kathleen Johnson says great dishes. <sighs> Mickey Rich, should embrace that song. Rich just told Megan she won the knife sharp. She was the knife sharpener winner. Oh, Mickey, you're so fine. You're so fine. You blew my mind. Hey, Mickey. I think that's a winner. If there was a song like that that said, Hey, Craigie, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blew my mind. Hey, Craigie, I'd be happy. Um, Colleen Barbella, how, how much uh, capers do you use? Oh, about, uh, for this dish, figure about a table, uh, figure about a, about a tablespoon per person. That should, that should cover you up. And don't be afraid to get a little bit of that uh, caper brine in there. That adds a lot of flavor. Well... Well done as always. We have uh, broken the one hour mark again. I keep thinking all these last about an hour or so, but they always tend to go a little longer because of the good folks out there. Uh, we can't do without your questions. I'm very grateful for your questions. I'm very grateful to uh, the Queen of Quarantine, Miss mm -hmm. Maureen, behind the camera. Thank you. Thank you very much, honey. I couldn't do it without you. You're welcome. And uh, I want to thank all the essential workers who we get to salute every night at 7. Thank you, folks. And a uh, big shout-out as well to all those folks at the grocery stores uh, who are standing there checking out groceries, uh, putting themselves out there. So much appreciated. So many great people out there who have, have gone above and beyond during this whole thing. So uh, a lot of gratitude. And as I always say at the end of these things, if you can, Find a way to stay connected, reach out to some, some friends, do some Zooms, things like that. Um, and one of the ways I think that we all get to stay connected in this non-pandemic world, particularly as I've learned over these years, is in the libraries. I, I'm fascinated and really impressed at how the library is the center of uh, the community in so many towns throughout Long Island. Obviously, I never went to libraries as a kid, and that's why I'm doing cooking shows in my kitchen. Uh, but I'm very grateful tonight to the Bayport Blue Point Library. We have a long, long relationship. So uh, thank you, folks, for having me tonight here in my kitchen. And I look forward to being back in your kitchen very soon. So stay connected, folks. Isolation. Okay. I love you. <laughs>